Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, once again we come before you as your children by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving, given access, Lord, uh, to you. Giving, un given understanding by means of the Holy Spirit uh, to your word. We're so thankful, Lord, to be called your children, to have the opportunity uh, to, to have your word, to be in your word, to seek your truth. And Father, uh, we are very aware of what a privilege this is. And we pray, Lord, your presence this morning as we seek to know, understand, and uh, just to have the truth of you that you would have us to know. We pray your Holy Spirit would be our guide this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 19, verse 13 is our text. And we're going to go through verse 15 this morning. If you would, uh, follow along as we read this, the word of the Lord together. <clears throat> then there were brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them, and pray. And the disciples rebuked them, but Jesus said, Suffer, little children, and forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. May God bless the reading of his word. <clears throat> you know, I was going through this passage, and the debate was, do I do a whole sermon on these three verses or do we continue on to the next part and um, well you probably picked up on what I decided to do it's these three verses there's two things uh, with our passage that I took note of this week first is just that it's a brief account it's an event that only lasts three verses and as that is the case often it is moved quickly through Second, it's a passage that because of its context, the little children, it's often simply and yet overly made into a point of emphasis being just that Jesus loves children. Uh, much of what I looked at uh, this past week in, in the conversational parts of my study basically drew that conclusion that Jesus just really loves the children Disciples didn't care much for children. Jesus loved them. He wanted to be around them. Um, I don't doubt that Jesus love, loves children at all. I just don't know that's the intent of this passage. And even if that is what we draw from it, it kind of leaves the student of the passage with a few questions. It leaves us asking, well, why this account? Why right here? Why does this just get plugged in right here and right now? It also leaves you asking, well, this is also, or noticing this is a second account in Matthew where Jesus is dealing with young children being brought to him or himself going and getting them. And perhaps even another one of these situations coming up. But then the other part of the question that it leaves us asking or begins to beg is why does it? he continued to reference the little children and the kingdom of heaven together. That reference alone leads us to, it draws our minds to think a little bit deeper, or have a few more questions than just saying Jesus loves children. What is meant here? Well, chapter 19, verse 13 begins, Then there were brought unto him little children. And I guess that's where the first part of our observation should begin. There's often much time spent on the subject of little children and trying to come into the idea of what the precise age is, trying to identify that age. I'm not going to spend much time there. Basically, the scripture says little children. The Greek word that's used there for little children is most often used of infants, young infants. I believe the, the point of emphasis here is dependence. They are fully dependent. 
Our text puts it that these children were brought under Christ, and the word there is describing them as the infants being presented unto Christ. You can picture it as the parent or the, the guardian bringing the child and presenting the child unto Christ. This is kind of the, the picture that is moved in on the text. So we have infants being brought or presented unto Jesus that he should put his hands on them and pray. <clears throat> So now we have the reason or intent for which they were brought. And that reason intent is that Christ should bless them or make supplication unto God on their behalf. So before we go any further, I want to bring to mind a few things that have already taken place since Jesus has come across the coast of Judea beyond the Jordan. If you remember, that takes place in chapter 19, verse 1. We had break, he leaves, he comes across the coast. This is all happening now within this section of a context. There's a few things, and namely I'll give three general things that have taken place in which these three verses follow on the heels of. The first one is that as Jesus came across Judea beyond the Jordan, a great multitude followed him and were healed by him. We see that in verse 2. The second thing that took place is the Pharisees came unto him to tempt him concerning the topic of putting away a wife, verse 3 and on. Then the disciples find Christ's teaching on wives hard to swallow, verse 10. So those are some of the three things that have led up to this, and now you have parents presenting their children, seeking Christ to make supplication for him. My question here in my study was, what have we learned from these prior three things concerning Christ our Lord? I observe three things I'll offer to you this morning. Number one, God heals. He's compassionate. He has compassion. That would be the first. A crap multitude follows. He has compassion. He heals. It's of the nature and character of God. He suffers much with us and is compassionate towards us. Number two, God knows nothing of divorce or putting away. The concept of God's covenant making and God's promises is that God keeps his promises and keeps his covenant no matter the depravity or the state of us. Matter of fact, he is so faithful that when we show ourselves not just unworthy but unable, that is when he takes glory in making himself known as the only one who is able. Number three, God knows who can receive what. That was his response to the disciples, right? That some can receive the saying, some cannot. And God knows how certain ones have been created, and that goes back into God's long-suffering and his mercy and our full dependence upon him. So it's in observing those three things about God that I take note of that as we go forward. And then we have this situation where parents bring their children to him that he should make supplication or pray over them, and the disciples rebuke them. Now, all of you probably note that the disciples did not rebuke the crowd for following Christ. They didn't say, you're following too closely. They didn't say, stop coming to him for healing. They didn't say, back off. Neither did they seek to stop the healings or feel the need to stop the Pharisees to come to Christ with questioning purposed for tempting him. They didn't feel the need to stop that. Yet here with infants being brought that Christ might pray over them, the disciples are permitted, I believe for our benefit, to step in. We would be remiss if we did not note verse 10 where the disciples are struggling with what Christ has taught on marriage. Have you not read in the intent and purpose of God and the display of the commitment of God? And so they were struggling with marriage in verse 10 and the weight of what that means. And now in verse 13, they struggle with little children being brought to Christ. I believe everything in the text shows forth the culture of the time versus the character of God. 
I believe our attention is being drawn there, and I want to step back for a minute for us to remember the full context of what's taking place. The ministry of Christ is coming to a conclusion, right? He has told his disciples already that he is preparing. He is going to the cross. He's preparing to go to the cross. The disciples have not jumped on board with that yet. They are waiting. They are still believing the kingdom is coming, represented here. He is prepared to overthrow the kingdoms of this world and establish his kingdom. Remember, just a chapter ago, they're arguing over who's the best in that kingdom and who's going to be the greatest in that kingdom. Christ is going forth. The disciples are still looking at culture, the culture battle. Christ is displaying before us the character and purpose of God. Now, I don't want to go too much into the white spaces, but I believe understanding the context, we have enough in Scripture to know that the disciples here are still looking for that kingdom. And thus, the crowds to the disciples, I just wonder if that is seen by them as a good discussion or rather a good following. It's good for someone who's seeking to establish the kingdom to have crowds, to have a mass of people following them. It's good for one who is seeking to establish a kingdom to show his goodness and power, demonstrate his power and his strength and his goodness to the people. I wonder if they view the discussion with the religious leaders as good because it shows the wisdom of Christ, the kingly wisdom and his ability to take on the religious leaders of that time. I wonder if they view the promoting of a culturally challenging truths as a bit of a struggle. Maybe we shouldn't go there. That might be a little bit too much for people to swallow. And I wonder if they view the infants as not really holding much purpose and moving forward the kingdom. I wonder those things. I don't know those things. Whatever is the case, the disciples rebuked those who were presenting the little children. Verse 14, Jesus said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me. So the disciples rebuke the children from being brought unto Christ. And Jesus steps in at this point and tells his disciples, don't send them away. Don't send them away. But allow them to come. Now the why Jesus does this follows. For such is the kingdom of heaven. So what is the kingdom of heaven? It's the kingdom of Christ, right? It is the kingdom of which Christ is the king. And though there will be a physical presence of it upon this earth, it is a kingdom that is not made up as such of the earthly kingdoms of this world. It is a kingdom of totally opposite operation. It is a kingdom of a king of which the likes of this world has never known. So the battle between the culture of the time and the truths of Christ is perfectly logical and to be expected here. But the makeup of the kingdom of heaven as being, t being that of the little infant children being presented unto Christ, even in the midst of a world so opposed, is the truly revealing and wondrous truth of God within this text. This is the part of where I didn't want to just skim quickly over these three verses. Because whenever I read something concerning the kingdom of heaven, I just want to know more. If you recall back in chapter 18 when the disciples were arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus called an infant child to himself, and actually he went and he got that infant child and he brought that infant child and the scriptures say he set the infant child in the midst of the disciples. Now it was preparing this message, it just struck me in a funny way. Because he sets the child in the midst of the disciples, an infant child in the midst of the disciples. So picture an infant child. And he says, verily I say unto you, to you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Now picture the disciples who were just arguing about who's the greatest all around an infant child set right in front of them thinking, what in the world? Do you get that picture? Unless you become like this. That is, the text describes that infant child laying in the midst of the disciples, placed in the midst of the disciples by Jesus for them to observe what they must be converted to become like. If you want a kingdom of this world, then I think you go and get it. Go. But if you're looking unto the kingdom where Christ is king, the kingdom that's not of this world, then understand this. You are dependent fully upon Christ. There are a few things that the disciples, I think, would have been able to observe, or perhaps more properly, I think we could observe from the text. Number one, that child could do nothing. The child placed in their midst could do nothing. Number two, that child was taken by Christ and set in their midst. And number three, Christ said, who will enter the kingdom of heaven and is one such as those who are taken and received by him and placed there. Now, we go one trip over to chapter 19. And again, we have infant children in the picture. And this time, instead of Christ saying that you have to be converted to be as them, he says, such is the kingdom of heaven, an infant child presented unto Christ. I believe that it won't, wouldn't be inappropriate to understand in part that the kingdom of heaven is going to be made up of those who are dependent upon, comforted in, and provided in fullness by Christ Jesus our Lord. The kingdoms of this world, this world in general even, is a collection of ladders that people climb to get to the top. You see that as you observe the world? It's just a, a collection of, you get to one stage, you climb one ladder, you get to the next one, right? We could start as far back as you want. You begin pre-K, you got to climb that to get to kindergarten, to get to elementary school, to get to middle school, to get to high school, to get to college, to get the career, to get the job, to get the house, to get the cars, to get the lifestyle, to get the retirement, to get the casket, right? It's all one ladder to climb up to get to the next point. And that's the end of the world. That's the ladder. And your hope is that at some point there's enough glory made about self where you show for people enough that you're successful enough. And those are the endless ladders that the world climbs. In the kingdom of heaven, there's a little bit of different picture that's being developed. Number one, the head or the top is already established. Christ is Lord. He is king. There's no climbing a ladder to get to that point. It's fixed. He is king. And the inhabitants of the kingdom take pleasure, comfort, and rest in he who is the head, and they rest in their place in him. So it's an entirely, completely opposite form of life from anything that this world has ever known. This world is always trying to climb the ladder, and it's always, even in a good way, it's always purpose. You can make this world a better place. You can do better. In the kingdom of heaven, no, you can't get better than what this king has done. You can't get better than having him be your king. So life is flipped, and I would argue for the better. Not only this, but what does this text teach you of Christ, who is the king of the kingdom? Firstly, he steps in that the dependence should not be prevented in any way from being brought unto him. He steps right in. Second, he laid his hands on them and departed thence. He interceded. He offered supplication on their behalf. Beloved, I hope by this point you're beginning to see that this is you and I and Christ is our king. He steps in that we may by nothing and by no means be prevented from being drawn unto him. And in stepping in in that way that we would be drawn unto him when made known as his, he is our intercessor. 
helpless that we might be, Christ still calls unto himself, us unto himself and intercedes on our behalf. You've observed in the text prior that Christ heals the sick, right? You've observed that God suffers long with the hardened heart. If you remember the topic of putting away and, and the divorce put into the law of Moses, it was because God was suffering much with his people. And it was because of their hardened hearts that they sought it. You've also observed from the prior text that he knows who can handle what. But here we observe that God, that Christ Jesus our Lord, the King, takes glory not in the things offered to him by the dependents, but he takes glory in his provision and his blessing for his dependents given by him. This is the most empowering truth for the believer and beloved of God. If we could grasp this truth, it would transform our lives. So that's a big statement, so I have to follow that up with how so, right? Two weeks ago, we were discussing the education of our young. I tried to, to further develop or to further sound a merciful alarm that much of our Christian education is Bible-coded humanism and heavily rooted in a moralistic theology and doctrine. To say that simply, most of our Christian education is the system of education that we have known, and we've kind of taken that system of education in and refitted it to have some Bible verses in it and purposed in Bible, and we've set that as our curriculum, right? And I'm not trying to sound like I'm knocking that thing. I'm trying to say, let's, let's look at where we, let's us, let us observe where we are and do it. If this is good and this is right, fine. If, if that is the pursuit and the areas we want to take, fine. But really, what is it? So let me explain. Humanistic education, or you could call it religious merit if you wanted to broaden it to not just your child's education, but even our religious practices, okay? So this is applicable to everybody. Humanistic education, the patterns in which we've been brought up with, the things in the church which would be seen as religious merit. You do things, you earn more of God's love. You know from Scripture that's a basic tenet of the faith that you cannot do that. God has loved you fully since before the foundations of the world. You cannot earn any more, you cannot lose any of it. He is perfect in His love for you. So, the education of the humanistic style and the religious merit says study. Study. In school, study those topics, study those curriculums, study those subjects. In church, it's study those devotionals, study those commentaries, study those catechisms, all, all of this. Know. Know what you have studied. Once you know what you have studied, then do it. As you do it, earn that new position. Earn that next level. Get up to the next level. And once you get up to that next level, advance forward and begin again. Study, know, do, earn, advance. Accomplish more. Show more of your ability. Show more of why you are the one deserving of glory. Or even, let's not put it in what we might hear as a negative light. Study, know, do, earn, and advance. And the more that you do that, the more that you can serve God with your advancement. You've heard that, right? We've all stri striven in that manner. This is, this is an area in which we've all been raised in this culture. The alarm that I've been trying to sound is that Bible doctrine or the maturation of grace, I believe goes something like this. Here, is here, Know, love, worship, rest. Hear the word of God. Hear the word of God. Now you all know you hear the word of God. Those who hear the word of God are those who have been given ears by God. And so in the hearing, 
the very first thing you do is you know. Those who hear his voice know him. You know the truths of God. You hear them. You are made mindful of them. You love God for hearing and knowing who God is. You worship God because you know his greatness and you rest in God. But in the same way, these things repeat. And what you learn is not your advancement in the world and your abilities, but you learn the greatness of God and further your rest in him, your worship and your exercising of love. I would have you notice how closely the second is to the description of a child. The child hears the voice of their parents. That's their protector, their provider, the one who has given them life. They know that voice. They learn the goodness of it. They love what they come to know. They trust in it. There is, if I can use a word, a form of worship. You know the young child well in which they can view the father or the mother with no limitations. There's no problem in life that's bigger than what mom and dad can take care of. And so the child learns to rest in it. And oh, the parent says, if only you would continue to trust and to trust. Christian Discipleship, the, immer the immersion, as Matthew 28 puts it, of the people of God and the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and the teachings thereof, is built upon the hearing, knowing, love, worship, and rest that's found in God alone. The pull of the church and the people of God is to find strength in crowds or to find purpose in accepted cultural traditions or to find legitimacy in their own abilities. And yet here we see Jesus heading to the cross and blessing an infant child and saying, that's who makes up the kingdom of heaven, one such as this. Here we observe, he who will <clears throat> enable our conversion, we observe him teaching us and showing himself as he who is bigger than our greatest need by his power and sovereignty and by his sacrifice and love, making us his children, free from the bondage of sin by his sacrifice upon the cross. Now, I tell you as a pastor, as a husband, and as a father, though the practices of some education may look the same, though the daily routine and general observer who would observe the life of a Christian might look at it and say generally it looks the same. I would encourage you to take note, it's not. It's not the same. It's long been my prayer that the heart of a child, again, not childish, childishness, but the trusting, the needing heart of the child, the worshipful heart directed towards God, would not grow cold. And it's now my prayer for all of you that the same would be true. I pray that you might know that life for the people of God who are of the king, whose kingdom is not of this world, well, our life and the life that we instill in our children is not about advancement. And I want to say that again. The life, I'm encouraging you. You don't have to take this, but I'm encouraging you to look at it, at the very least, look at it. The purpose for which you are discipling and training your young is not for advancement in the world. It is about hearing, knowing, loving, worshiping, and resting in God Almighty. There is no problem or situation in this world that that cannot carry the believer through. And as a parent, isn't that your greatest heart and concern? To know that my child will know throughout every season of life in whose arms they can rest and in whom they can look to and be comforted by. I pray that you don't harbor a need for advancement in life as adults and set that track. That would serve only to develop a double-mindedness within you. 
It's hard in a world, compete, a world in which we observe competing kingdoms to think that you don't need to be yourself an earthly king or advancing or kicking your feet all the harder just to stay afloat and stay above the waters and the tides of the world. That's a difficult truth to renew in your mind on a daily basis. Especially in today's culture. Parents, you can understand that. I need not go into detail. It looks like the tide is rising and the natural impulse is kick harder, run faster, advance further. Put more storage in, do whatever you need to do. The people of God have long struggled with such. With understanding that God is better than the assurances of any king of this world or any kingdom or any advancements that we can make. Israel struggled with it. They wanted a king just like the world. And God was saying, I'm enough. Nonetheless, wherever you find yourself this morning, here's what I know. Your Father in heaven knows how to train you up for what you are to be in the heavenly abode. So no matter what circumstances or you're wrestling with the trusting of God, just like our children can re wrestle with us and trusting us at some times when we tell them, do this, do this, why, 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 why? Trust me, do it. Our Heavenly Father knows exactly what we need to do even when we're wrestling to that degree. And He trains us up. He loves us. He disciplines us. He shapes us and He molds us. Whether you realize it or not, when you are made able to see full and to move past this shadow of things, you will realize that all along, you indeed have been a dependent of God's. That's the glorious part of arriving in the presence of Christ I can't wait for. To in the midst of it just see, all along I've been His dependent. God has been there watching me on the playground of life and directing me knowing exactly what is doing and directing every step and every move I should make. You are a dependent of God's, a child of the King, and He indeed has taken you through the pilgrimage of this world and drawn you unto Himself where you shall forever know His blessing and His rest. So as a pastor, I simply long that you might hear and know your God and those truths here and now no matter your circumstance. That you would know that your ultimate place and position is a fullness of rest. I'm not talking about sleeping. I'm talking about that perfect contentment. That godliness and contentment is great gain. It's contentment in a world which contentment is a true impossibility outside of the truths of God. No man can be content but by the Spirit of God. I pray that you would know His rest. I pray that we would all be moved to direct our children in the same. You know, I had a, the song which was based on Psalm 95, and I want to read that to you. It says, Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. I want to pause there because as a believer that is you either see that as true or I should say as a believer you hold that as true. There is not a single cell part portion of this earth that was not created and is not instructed by God Almighty. He is our God says verse 7. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. In other words, he's the shepherd. He directs us where to go. Today, if you hear his voice, 
Do not harden your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long I was grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Now, I believe that that's spoken, what is spoken there as a description of the people of God is exactly what happened in their life, in that generation. They did not enter into his rest. They kept running into the circular, circular formations of their own hardened hearts. That's why I have a plea this morning as a pastor. Don't harden your hearts to think that you can't trust God fully. Don't harden your hearts to think that his word is not sufficient for every good work that you and your children are being trained up for. Don't harden your hearts to that. When our hearts are set more upon the advancement of the world, more upon the pleasures of the flesh or customs of men, or even that of good merit, then we become a people who err in heart and fail not to know the ways of the church, but fail to know the ways of God. It is only in knowing God that the people of God have ever known this truth. And it's a big truth. God makes a way. Now everybody's asking what should I do and what way should I go and everybody's in their merit is trying to prove we have to go this way. Trust me, I went this way. I made the track. This is the way that works. The believers throughout every age have been shown, trust God, trust God, God makes a way. And it's mightier than anything they could fathom or imagine. I'm just childish, childish of heart enough to believe this applies to every part of life. Every part of life. God is making a way for his beloved. He is doing exactly what he sees fit to do. He is perfecting and completing each and every one of us. And we have the wonderful opportunity to rest in that. Not just to rest in that, but to learn it ourselves. Be comforted by it. And hold it as the greatest of all truths to be learned. The world runs in circles. Pursuing different things which all promise more pleasure or rest and yet anxiety schedule and the weight of life only compounds. We've all been educated under such a sad state, but the word of God points us to know the ways of God. Parents and I find especially homeschoolers, you love Deuteronomy 6, don't you? I do. I love Deuteronomy 6. I hate to say it, well I don't hate to say it, but it makes a point, so I'll say I hate to say it, but that education and training spoken of in Deuteronomy 6 has nothing to do with classical education as you have known it. The form and formality of education and subjects of education that you have known. Deuteronomy 6 has everything to do with the knowing of God and remembering the ways of God throughout all of life from when you wake up to when you lie down. That's what the parent's duty in education is. That's it. But you got to believe that all truth and all knowledge that is worthy of anything and that is anything good rests and resides in God alone. If our education, our job training, our life pursuits, and thus the training of our young are not founded in the, and purposed for remembering and knowing the ways of our God, then what are they but evidences of our idols and robbers of our peace and rest that we have in Christ? Children of God, I ask you, don't let your hearts be hardened, but be still and incline your ears unto God that you, your mind may be renewed and that you might know the good and perfect will of God, that you might rest in the strength of his might, resting in who he is and the truth that he works all things together for those who loved him, love him and are called according to his purposes that he shall complete the work that he has begun in you 
for your good, but for the glory and pleasure of him. Children of God, rest knowing the hand of Christ, the prayer, the intercession of Christ and the spirit is given before the throne on our behalf, according to Romans 8. Children of God, rest knowing you are the children of God. That truth alone should cause you to rest. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows not us, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Imagine people of God, elders and older in the church. Imagine if we remembered that with a childlike trust and directed our lives by it and instilled that path and laid that path out for our children that they might continue that trust throughout their life, that they might hear God, know God, love God, worship God, and rest in God alone. Imagine the strength of that generation. It's one that could take down any Goliaths. It's one that could survive any storm. We need that today. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you and observe your word, we pray that your spirit would complete this teaching within us. As we observe the heart of Christ, the heart of you, Heavenly Father, who does not cast out those who are dependent upon him, who does not cast out the helpless or the meek or the lowly, but invites them in, and of such builds your kingdom around. What a glorious kingdom it will be to observe all of the people called by your name, trusting and resting in your goodness for all eternity. A contentment. A burden-free walk of life. A great hope, a great fullness that is ours in you. We thank you for this as we remember the sacrifice which has brought us in and made us known as your own. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. We love you. And we rest in you. For we pray all this by means of Jesus our Lord. Amen.